good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Hope Community Church. I hope everybody is doing well out there from your homes, wherever you are. Um, we're uh, in a transition and sort of trying to transition back to regular life, whatever that is, if that's even possible. Uh, I was telling my friend uh, today on the phone that uh, the first couple of weeks of this thing, I was kind of... I was good, you know. I, I knew that it it was kind of new, and and uh, we didn't know what would happen, and just stay home, stay put, and it was kind of fun. It was kind of exciting, um, and then all that wore off, and now I'm like sick and tired of doing nothing. I'm sick and tired of being at home, but then I don't really know if I want to go back to how it was. Um, I'm kind of just not that motivated to do anything, and maybe in a little bit of a cycle, but. Um, but who knows? Who knows how things will go and what will happen next? Uh, I think that, you know, it's weird. There's still a lot of debate as to what's the right thing to do. And I just want to encourage you to uh, do whatever you think you should, whatever you think is right. I think that uh, we have a responsibility and obligation to our, our to, to people to, to, uh, to not get, to not be sick and to be responsible about ourselves that we're feeling like maybe we are sick and just to wash our hands to be mindful of other people um and uh and and that we continue to remember what's important in our lives i think that's one of the great challenges of this whole thing is that doesn't change that this whole all this happened doesn't change what's important and um we need to be careful, especially as Christian peoples. We have to be careful and to keep our uh, to keep our heads in the midst of all this chaos, and to be an example uh, for the world. And uh, I wanted to talk along those lines today uh, about how to be an example and what we should be doing um, in terms of uh, in terms of the poor, in terms of um, as this thing. Um, spirals our economy further and further into crisis, um, not only nationally, but on a world scale, there, there are a lot of problems. And, um, and I just think we're just getting into the beginning of some of these problems. And, you know, I'm not here to make us all feel bad and to be worried about it. And I know that the truth is that most of us are as good as the last person we talked to or the last information we read about any of this. If, you, if you're like me, if I've talked to my friend that's positive about it, I get off the phone with them, I'm positive. If I talk to somebody else that's nervous or scared, worried about things, I get nervous and scared or worried. If I read a good article that shows hope, I, I seem to have hope. If I read an article that it's, it's like everything's going to fall to pieces, you know, then I just want to go hide under my bed. So, you know, we, a lot of this is about trust and about trusting each other and, um, and just trying to discern um, what the right thing to do is. And, and, I, there's not a clear-cut thing, and it's hard to know who to trust. And I think that we have to just do our part and do what we can and just be as responsible as we can. And we're going to get through it. Um, but uh, so, yeah, anyway, that's uh, that's uh, a little bit uh, about the corona coronavirus experience. Uh, uh, I used to ask my dad uh, when... I was young. I, in fact, I remember a phase of my life where I asked him questions all the time. And I think my eight-year-old might be in this phase. I'm not sure yet. But it, it just becomes where you start to ask questions about everything. And I used to ask him questions. And he used to get pretty mad at me about the questions I would ask. And I remember asking this one time, if, if Dad, if watermelons, like seeds, were planted on the moon, what would happen? He completely loses his stuff at me, and I remember I never forget that because he's like, "What if? What if watermelons seeds were planted on the moon?" He's like, "I don't know. It doesn't matter, you know." And uh, but he was pretty good about answering my questions, and uh, it was just a phase maybe I was going through in life where I ask a lot of questions. But every once in a while, I'd ask a good question, and I I remember when I was young, wondering this a lot and asking this a lot. But I remember asking my dad, Dad, are we rich? Um, and he was really good about answering. He was really wise about how he would answer it. He would take that seriously, and he would always say, Yes, but we are rich. Um, we're very rich. 
and then I would say, but dad, but we don't, we don't have really big houses like some of these people are, I, you know, I can't, I don't, I, back then when I was little, I, I just wanted like Reebok pumps or Nike Air. I was like, we can't, I can't get these really good tennis shoes. And, uh, and he's like, well, you can be rich in some things and not in other things. And he says, we're really rich in love and we're rich in family and we're rich in friends and we have everything that we need. And he's like, and so we're really rich and, and we're rich in God. And he said, but you know, you can be rich in some things and poor in other things. He's like, and we're really not poor in very much of anything. He's like, and so he's like, in my estimation, we're really, really rich. And I don't know. Um, and he went on to talk about other things. I remember back then thinking, you know, how is it rich that we live in a free country? Or how are we, you know, uh, and, and now I understand a lot more uh, about what he was saying. And um, it, a lot of those things stuck with me. Uh, I've always considered myself rich, but not in the worldly ways, not in just the regular everyday sense, but rich in God and rich in faith and rich in friends and, and rich in, um, in just the, 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 um, the life experiences that I've gotten to have and the privileges that I've, I've, been, I've been afforded to me really am rich. Um, uh, but what I've come to realize as I've gotten older is that I'm, I'm really rich in money, too. And really, we all kind of are. Um, I have been afforded the privilege to go to third world country a, a few times. And every time I'd go, I'd come back. And I haven't gone a long time, but every time I go back, I quit going for a while because it, it depressed me. I would get really depressed at how much of the world was living in real poverty and how rich we were. And I just feel bad. I felt bad about it um, because, you, you know, we make up 6% of the world's population, Americans do, and we are consuming 50% of the world's resources. And, uh, you know, and I remember my dad too, like we'd be eating our cold vegetables and he would say, you're going to eat those vegetables because there are kids that are starving in Africa. And, um, and, you know, when I went and saw all that stuff, I thought it couldn't get any worse than this. I mean, these people are so poor. It, it can't, I had no idea it was this bad and it can't get any worse. But, but then now apparently it has gotten worse. Um, over the last few weeks, I've gotten reports of our friends and, uh, and, and people are starving in Kenya, starving to death. You know, in Kenya, which is like 90 something percent Christian, before all this bad stuff happened, they had a 40% un unemployment rate. 40% unemployment, massive, massive unemployment rate. And so they were already struggling. And the way that this thing is working out is this, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a crisis, a hunger crisis across the, the globe. There's locusts and stuff that have eaten a bunch of the crops. Um, but this coronavirus has kind of slowed down the whole world economy and the supply lines back up. And the first people that get affected by this are the poor. And the poorest people get affected the worst, the first and um, and so people are starving. Um, and I saw some videos and stuff, and, and it just really bothered me, really wrecked me. Um, because what we're doing is we all have this scarcity mentality too right now, where we're thinking there's not enough toilet paper, there's not enough bacon, and like we're going out and like doubling up on luxuries to try to make to fortify ourselves and try to make sure that we have everything we need, but not everything we need, like more because we're scared we're going to run out and we've got like, we get all greedy and everything. And that's just the tendency for us. Um, but, you know, in the Bible, Christian people behave differently. In the New Testament, Paul doesn't even just teach this, but he's, he, he cites examples of Christians that were led to, to be completely countercultural in terms of the way that they experienced crisis, the way that they went through pain and suffering. You know, Christians weren't a part of the problem. They were always part of the solution. And people would be running one way, and Christians would be running, r running away from everything, and Christians would be running towards the problems. You know, when, th when there were skin diseases and leprosy and stuff, it was Christians that were willing to be around the lepers. Um, the, 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 most of the schools for deaf and blind around the world and, sc school, uh, and hospitals for the mentally handicapped, it was Christian people 
that ran to those places where nobody else wanted to have anything to do with them. They ran to those problems that nobody else wanted to touch, those impossible situations. It was Christian people that were fueled by God's love and empowered by God's grace that came in there and, and did those beautiful, miraculous things that made the world better. And so really, if you're a Christian or Christ follower, then we're obligated to, to, to react and to be very different um, in these times. And one of the ways uh, that we need to be thinking about uh, these times is how we can help the people that are poor. And I know what you're saying. I know you're saying like, these are times where we have to save and we got to tighten up and we got to be careful. We need to put back and we need to make sure we can afford what we have and, and all that. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do all that stuff. Um, but you have an obligation. I have an obligation to care for the poor. Um, over and over and over again in the Bible, uh, it warns us about taking care of the poor and the consequences for not doing so. And we shouldn't do that because we're afraid of what God will do. We should do it out of love for our brothers and sisters. In First John, he says, how can you love God who you, uh, have you not seen if, if you can't love your brother who you have seen? And uh, he says, so let love be without hypocrisy. And, and so I've been trying to reflect on at least, you know, what can I do? What can I do? We, what can we do? You know, we're quarantined, first of all. We're maybe financially, we've got uh, some concerns, but we're still rich. We're still really, really, really rich. Um, I, uh, I uh, want, want to read a passage. It's uh, out of 2 Corinthians. And you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but the New Testament doesn't talk that much about giving. Um, you would think it would be a central theme um, because of the amount of time that TV preachers spend on it. But the New Testament doesn't talk that much about, about giving. Uh, and tithing, uh, giving a one-tenth, is, 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 is found almost uh, completely only in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. Um, but there's a, there's, Paul spends a, a, a little bit of time on giving in 2 Corinthians, and he and I want to read to you what he, uh, who, or just what he says about it, because he cites these people that are very, very poor, and he's really amazed at how much they're willing to give and how generously they gave, not out of their abundance, but out of their poverty. And he saw this as a miracle of the church and of generosity, and he saw it as this grace. He saw it as this place where God's activity was just booming, okay? And it comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm, I'm just going to read it up to you here. It says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and, and then by the will of God also to us. Um, and he says, and I'm not commi- uh, He says, I want you to be blessed in this in this same uh, area of giving. And he says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test test the sincerity of your love by comparing. It with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for his for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you, you may become rich. Um, and he goes on uh, to to talk more about that stuff, but and, and he encourages generosity. And I'll and I'll leave you uh, and I'll stop with this. But he says, remember this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Did you catch that last part? Because that, I think, is the, the, what comes around to us when we do God's work, when we... Um, give ourselves to the concerns that God is concerned about, when we care for the people that God cares about, when we do His will, the good thing is, is that we can expect return. And what is that return? 
uh, that God is able to bless you abundantly and that in all things and at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. And so God meets our needs. Here's the crazy thing about God's economy. God's economy is completely different from your economy and my economy. You can make it with more on less if God's blessing is on your life and on your house and on your family. Like God's blessing, God's goodness, it, that's what we're really after. That's what we really always have needed, okay? Always have always have needed. So insurance and more money in the bank and more guns and more bullets and more toilet paper and more food is the way of the world, right? We need God, and we ask God to meet our needs. We pray to God for our provision every day. And as he meets our needs, and as he gives to us, we're also, it's to be a blessing. It's also to be a blessing to others and to, to give as much as that we can. And so we're obligated to, to have concern for our brothers and sisters, the poor people. Uh, but, you know, we're sitting here, and we're thinking that we need all this stuff, but we really don't. We're really still really, really, really rich. And so I have been thinking, I know we can't do a lot, but what can we do? Our friends at Global Connections, because they have people on the ground, because we know a bunch of people there, and we just know there's a pulse. We, there's a, a, we can keep and really know what's going on there. And we have a, a way to really meet a need directly. And so they organize a thing to where they're, they're meeting these needs. And so for $50, for a, a, you can feed a whole family of five for a whole month. Now you think about that for $50. $50. Uh, we can probably all afford $50. And it, it, I don't want to, it's not about being guilt. It's not about getting God to bless. It's just about we need to do what we can do. And, and we can do that. And I think most of us can do that. And I think about how much further it goes. $50 here doesn't seem like a lot, but over there it matters so much. Imagine if you're a family of five and you're looking at it, living in a nation with 40% unemployment. What are you hoping is going to happen? Um, years ago, I heard this guy named Gary Haugen speak. And he is the... Uh, leader, he started this thing called the uh, International Justice Mission. And you ought to look them up. They do phenomenal work all over the world. They're just lawyers. All right. And how can anything good come from a big old team of lawyers? Well, these guys are like the good guys. And they go around and they find stories. They find people in the third world that have that, that, and nobody's represented them. Nobody's taking care of them. And they start to represent them legally because they're, these people are getting oppressed and they're being kicked around and they need somebody to be their advocate. And so the, so the International Justice Mission comes in and they, and they become the advocates, these people that have nobody to fight for them. Just another good thing that the Church of Jesus Christ does in the world. These people are running to their problems every day and they're changing the world. And I remember Gary Haugen, and Gary Haugen put this picture of this girl on the screen and he starts talking uh, her, to, about her by name, and I don't even remember her name. But he, he's saying, you know, what Christians want to do for this girl is they want her to know that God is good. And, and, and that's what we do, you know. Hey, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And, we, and you know, we want to preach the gospel, and we love you know, all the good sides. But this girl, her parents orphan, like didn't want her, and she was thrown out, so she never knew her parents, and she got picked up into to sex trafficking, and she was just a sex slave for her whole childhood. So when your whole childhood is, you know, having to have sex with 50 men a day, and you, and you just are on the brink of starvation, you know, you never owned a toy in your life, you've never seen a Christmas, you've never seen a birth, you never don't even know what your birthday is. Like, it's hard to believe that God is good when that's your vantage point. And I remember him saying that, and it just just stopping me in my tracks because I would always think that the gospel would be the good news and that it would get through to people and that there was something magical and powerful somehow about the gospel and that it would like break through everything and that it would somehow save everybody and that the gospel was important. The gospel is what we should preach and and and. You know, we're just making the world a better place to go to hell from if we don't preach the gospel. 
But this lady, this girl needs a reason to believe that God is good. And we have to give her a reason to believe that God is good before she's ever going to believe the words that we say, that God really is good. And why should she when nothing, nothing ever comes that gives her a glimmer of hope? Uh, nothing evidences that there's a God that exists at all unless the people of God come together, unless love rules, unless me and you <laughs> do what we can. And, you know, we can't change the world. I mean, I've, I've said it a thousand times. I'll never forget this world hunger poster. Can't change the world, but we can change the world for one person. And I can't change the world, but, I, but right now I can change the world for five people, for a family of five um, in the third world. Uh, I can't do much, but I can do that. And I can do that right now, and I can afford that. Um, you know, there's all sorts of cynical comments, and a lot of people have weird things about this. Um, you know, people argue things like, well, the poor will always be with you. Jesus said that, and, and he did. Um, but it doesn't change. Um, it doesn't change, you know, Matthew 25. It doesn't change... Um, that we have an obligation that, and that we're, that we're commissioned to go and to serve and to love people everywhere and that we're, that we're to represent God as a generous and all-caring, all-loving God. It doesn't change any of that stuff. And I'm afraid um, that a lot of times uh, we're fooling ourselves. And, and the truth is that maybe, maybe God is... is You'll find God when you start to serve the poor. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, when you start to give a little bit and do what you can do, maybe, maybe you start feeling like your prayers are heard again. A lot of times, there's spiritual things are funny, you know. A lot of times, I'll, I'll be blocked spiritually for some reason. I won't know why, and I'll have to probe my heart and kind of empty out my heart and my thoughts and my mind. And, and sure enough, there'll be something that God wanted me to see. And I don't know, but I think we're rich. I think here in America, we're so worried about our bacon, but people are dying and people are starving. And so I, I wanted to use this time, this week, to beg you to consider giving $50 a month to the poorest of the poor. Remember the churches in Macedonia. They were so poor. And Paul's like, these people are so poor. We didn't expect that much, but they gave so much more. In their poverty, they gave. In the Gospels, Jesus, they're all watching these people line up to put the money in the treasury. And it says this widow comes in and gives the, her last two pennies that she has. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, she put more in than all of the rest. All of the rest, because she gave out of her poverty instead of out of her surplus. And so if you want to bless the heart of God today, if, if, if you want to, to, if you're a little scared at night when you read, you know, the words of Matthew 25, where Jesus says, when I was hungry, did you give me something to eat? When I was thirsty, when I was sick, did you visit me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Then maybe this is what you can do, because it is something that you can do, it's something that we can do together. And collectively, I think that we, um, can give hope to a small part of the world. And, and who knows? Um, who knows what happens um, when we just act in faith and do what we can do? Uh, I'll leave you with this because this, this always makes, this is just always just the most beautiful picture for me. But imagine when Jesus tells his disciples, I want you to take this this five lo these five loaves of two fish, I want you to feed these 5,000 people. If that was you, what you would say. You would have been like the disciples. You would have said, there's 5,000, Jesus, and we only have five loaves and two fish, and your math's off because we, if, if, if we had 500, it wouldn't be enough. 500 wouldn't be enough. If you had 500, that'd be a lot. Wouldn't be enough to feed 5,000. If you even had 5,000 for everybody to have a bite. You just can't do it. And, and they were using their economy. They were seeing everything on their earthly level. And Jesus is like, feed them. Feed my people. And he multiplies that bread and that fish. And so he takes our small bit 
that and 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 the faith that we have at our at our small action, if we'll just offer to him what we have, who knows? Why can't he take that and bless it and end up feeding and doing a ton more with it than we could ever believe ever imagine? And that's what it says in Ephesians. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than all we can ask for or imagine, to him be the glory in the church. And so let's give God um, a chance, you know? Let's, let's dare to believe that God could use us to actually help the world. Let's, instead of just preaching and sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves, let's do what we can do. Let's mobilize our finances uh, in the ways that we can and help the people that are starving to death right now. I promise you, it'll make a difference in their life. And I just believe that the God of abundance, the God of blessing, the God that fed the 5,000 is going to meet all your needs as well as we all deal with this crazy time that we're in. So that's, uh, that's what I have to say today. The, we'll have some information uh, that we'll get out to, to uh, on our webpage and stuff. Um, to show you how to uh, to give to these families, but but continue to pray and to think about uh, about the world and the 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 world that we're in. Pray for the world. Pray for the country. Pray for our leaders. Um, pray for the 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 people that God has put into authority. We we have a lot of spiritual power as the church. In fact, I think as Rick Warren says that the smallest church has more spiritual power than the largest organization. And, um, and so we can do a lot from where we sit right now um, if we'll do it in faith. Let me pray for us and then we'll be done. Jesus, I ask that you would use this message. I pray that you convict us. God, we're sitting around in abundance. We're rich. If we're wondering whether or not we're rich or not, we're rich. We have plenty. Even the poorest among us are pretty well off. And I ask that, God, you would uh, help us. The, the richest church in all of world history, the North American church, I pray that you would mobilize us to give, that you would, that you would twist our hearts, Father, and, and, and convict us to care for the poor. And that instead of looking at how we can hoard for ourselves and save for ourselves and, and, and all this stuff for ourselves, how could we help the people that are in bigger needs than we, than, than, than we are? How can we help the people that are struggling worse than we are? And we could maybe get outside of ourselves and get busy doing your work. Because, Lord, as we've said, this does not change what's important. This coronavirus doesn't change what you've called us to do. Has, does not change how you've called us to act, doesn't change how you've called us to serve. So help us to step up to your cause, Lord Jesus. And we pray this in, Christ, in your name. Amen. Peace, friends.